All right, KubeCon, it looks like it's time. People still kind of filing in while, while they walk in. Um, how many of you have been to a KubeCon before? Cool, that's a lot. Um, how many have been to two KubeCons? Okay, a little less. Uh, how many of you are using Kubernetes in production? How many of you aren't but want to be? Okay, most of you are using Kubernetes in production. It's amazing. Last year when we did this, it was like half the hands in the room. Um, so that's really impressive. How many of you uh, like writing Go? How many of you have written Rust before? All right, that number is going to be a lot higher next year, I promise you. Um, so uh, my name's Oliver. Uh, I'm the creator of Linkerd. Um, I, I do a lot of work on the proxy side, but I work kind of across the project. Um, and I'm, I do a deep dive at every KubeCon that I go to, and uh, usually that's kind of a technical deep dive where I have lots of hand-drawn slides, and I kind of ramble over those. And I'm going to do a, try to do a slightly different one this time, and it's either going to be really quick and will be done quickly, and I'll have lots of time for questions, or I'll be running way over, and we'll, we'll find out soon. Um, but I want to talk about why, why do I work on Linkerd? Why do I spend all of my time working on Linkerd when I could be doing other things? Um, well, besides hanging out with my dogs, but yeah, other than that. So why does Linkerd exist? Um, I, I think that this is a, any project should have a, a good answer for this, but this answer is pretty personal for me. And so I, I want to talk about why Linkerd exists. We have to talk about why I was in a position to create this and work on this and why um, we're gonna continue working on this for quite some time. And to do that, uh, I have to take you back about a decade. This is not the start of my career, but it's where the story starts. Uh, I, I took a job at Twitter. It was down all the time. So anyone using Twitter in 2010? Okay, there was this thing called a fail whale, and every time you went to Twitter, you saw it. Uh, and it was a great place for someone who was in ops and, and wants to do kind of ops programming and system programming to go and participate. And I kind of quickly got funneled onto this problem where we had ganglion nodules, and we were trying to build our own data center and really expand and grow that, and uh, that wasn't gonna happen. So the, my manager, the, the head of ops, sat me down and said, Oliver, we need to get all of the host data into a time series database. This other, other group is working on a time series database. We gotta make sure all of the host and system data gets in there so that we can do ops alerts. And then some other people get into this project and say, well, that'd be really cool if we could add application metrics too. We have all these Ruby processes, unicorns, whatever is running Twitter at the time, that we also want to get into that system. And we actually need to provide alerting, because we can't use Nagios anymore because it's not going to work with the new system, so uh, we really need to go build our own huge alerting system in Java for some reason. And then uh, we also need customizable dashboards. Uh, we need, every team is going to have a different set of metrics they need, and Ganglia is just really not usable for anyone who's used a modern web page with JavaScript and such. And so we need to build a new framework or system for this. And this actually, anyone use the Bootstrap CSS framework? Uh, that came out of this project. Uh, Jacob uh, Fat and Mark Otto were the internal tools team and were working on a bunch of the things that were uh, fed into our Viz system. And then open sourced and have been wildly successful since. Uh, and we have, people on our team reading the Dapper paper at lunch and getting really excited about distributed tracing. And so uh, we had this Hack Week project called Big Brother Bird, and it was really cool because we could do distributed tracing in our application. And so now my team own it too, and now we have that, which is cool. And that thing became Zipkin, got open sourced, and is now no longer really maintained by Twitter, but is a pretty successful project. And because this service is used when we're debugging incidents, this thing has to be much more reliable than every other service of the company. And when it's down, <laughs> everyone's gonna let you know it's down really loudly. And this company is growing. We're at Twitter in 2010 when we know we're about to, we're on the track to IPOing, and in the middle of this, we decide we're gonna do microservices, and we invent Mesos and Aurora, and we add all of this extra complexity and all of these other metrics that we have to have, and uh, it was a bit of a ride. And so the observability system we built ended up looking something like this, and since I've left the team, it's, I'm sure, been improved quite a bit. Uh, but is that we had a collector that would go t 
talked, could, had a, could enumerate every host and could go get host metadata or host metrics from every host. Uh, we could also talk to Zookeeper server sets and discover things and then go collect data from there. And then we'd write that all into a service, a time series database called Cuckoo, that was at one point the largest Cassandra cluster in the world. And that's not something you want to brag about. Uh, it's something that you lose a lot of sleep over, actually. Uh, and that's all since been replaced. Thank everybody. Uh, and then what we want is we want a kind of nice queryable interface on that uh, so I can run ad hoc queries when I'm in an incident that I need to diagnose things so that we can build that, that dashboard system and so that our, our, our alerting system has some place to plug into and actually get data. And I, I was on that team for about three years or so. Uh, and as I was leaving, um, I wanted to go work on some other projects at the company that I thought would help the observability system. But there are a few big lessons. And one, it would have been really nice if there were open source tools at the time. Uh, OpenTSDB was just getting started while we were developing it, and it was a little bit of a too early to bet on. Um, and it wasn't, I don't necessarily think, a good bet. Uh, but now we have great reusable tools like Prometheus and Grafana that we can just drop in and they do this job great. And I don't want to project onto any companies, but I hope you all are not building your own observability systems anymore and are using something off the shelf. Two, the other thing I learned is that configuration is the root of all evil. Absolutely full stop. Um, that, that collector system we had was initially this Python thing I wrote, uh, twisted and you had to configure all of the targets and sources for it to go talk. So every time a new service came online, they had to file a ticket with me, and I would go edit a Python file, and I'd have to like, load balance all the configs to make sure the services were distributed. It was a lot of awful manual work for folks. Uh, it, it was what we needed to get out the door, but certainly not what was gonna scale that team up. And related to that is this, uh, the operation, operational data model is critical. And this is a bit of a loaded thing. Um, if you let people choose their service names and put that string in code and in config and in uh, spreadsheets, you will have many different names for a single service. And you won't really have a taxonomy to talk about what is the staging of the service versus the prod version of the service versus my version of the service that I'm using for development. And so we need to have a, a strong taxonomy in the system uh, that a system like that of observability system will use, for instance, to link tracing data to metrics data. Uh, that's not, as far as I know, still not possible at Twitter to go to a Zipkin dashboard and link to an alert, for instance. That would be wonderful, but we need common nouns that we can use to reference in URIs, basically, to reference across these systems. And the, the really surprising thing is that uh, I was so in over my head on the oper the building the system and operationalizing it and productionizing it, uh, that it, it kind of, you lose sense of what your problems you're solving, and like all of the technical problems, the scaling problems we were actually working on are, are solvable in a pretty short time frame. And that time frame is like a year or two. A team, a, a skilled team is able to go solve that problem and just work through those things. The organizational side of that is gonna be much more than a skilled team for a year or two going to work on a problem. And if you can't get folks to agree on the operational data model, for instance, it's gonna, or you can't get people in high leverage situation, places like a deploy system, it's gonna be really hard to instrument these things and productionize it. Um, this will all come back. These, are, these lessons are, are relevant. So after that, um, I, I played ping pong for about a year, and then uh, <laughs> if you worked at Twitter, you'd know that was true. Um, and then I went to work on this thing called uh, the traffic team. And we were given an instrument remit there. Uh, so we have, as I mentioned before, we had this Zookeeper service discovery cluster. Anyone here done Zookeeper service discovery? Anyone been on call for a Zookeeper cluster? <laughs> it's a tough, I, I feel you. Um, so we, we took that on for some reason, and uh, we were also very close to the Finagle team. So Marius Erickson, who is the creator of Finagle, was on this team with us, um, and we sat right next to the core libraries team who was building Finagle. And our, our job was really to uh, deal with service discovery related incidents and make sure we were fixing the kind of core infrastructure into Finagle. Finagle is a JVM Scala functional networking library uh, that makes, that basically every Twitter service is written in. So if you just go fix things there, you don't have to really worry about going to get people to upgrade. You just have to be like, deploy again and it will be fine. Um, and, and really the, the feature we were working on was staging. 
and more generally making request uh, routing flexible in a, in a complex topology. And so a very simplified version of Twitter might look something like this. You have a big front end tier that's doing all sorts of composition. Um, we have data services behind that that own different parts of the domain. And then we might have something like a user service. And every, everyone has a user service somewhere. Um, and let's say, like, this is three calls down in the system, and I want to do a new version of the user service. I want to stage out a version. Before, what we do is we probably pick one random host, upgrade it with the new code, and like, hope that doesn't, ho hope people remember that even happened. Hope that we can actually know those differences. Uh, so that'd be kind of canary. And, or we had very complex uh, staging infrastructures where you could basically reserve a whole stack of this and replace part of it for your use case. Uh, and you know, there can only be a finite number of those things because this is a lot of resources. And so people would be basically fighting over staging resources that they could go uh, claim to test their code. And so what we wanted to do is basically make that a header. So you can add a header onto your browser, and it says, instead of talking to the user service, talk to the user's v2 service. And anywhere that request goes with the context, uh, we can apply that logic. And again, because this is all in Finagle, every place we own, we can make sure these contexts get wired through properly. And as long as we don't hit any evil non-Finagle services, we'll be great. And so uh, the big lessons from my time on the traffic team were that microservices are all about communication. Um, in fact, the name Linkerd comes from this concept we learned on this team that really thinking about the system like a linker and a loader. A loader being something that schedules pods and create, or schedules resources and creates them. A linker being something that names these targets, names these other libraries. And in a microservice, your libraries are serve, are services that are running. They're not necessarily code units. And you link at the network layer. And so communication is the kind of fundamental thing that we have to solve here, or, al or allow for. And to do that, we need diagnostics out the nose. You, can't, you can no longer go to logs and try to correlate logs across various systems. You can no longer attach a debugger to one thing and inspect it and actually get a clue what's going on across the, the topology. We need to make sure that we're building diagnostics into the system th throughout into the traffic layer specifically, not just on the, the kind of resource level. And going back to the initial problem about solving organizational problems, um, the highest leverage way we found to do that was by putting things in Finagle. The thing that we knew was in every request path and every service of the company, we could go make these changes there. We had launched this whole new staging system without really having to get any of these services to buy into it or convince them about it. We could just deploy it, and even if they had a downstream service that they didn't know it was staging, we could implement all of this. Um, and so having that kind of fundamental infrastructure layer of control is really important to roll out these types of policy changes at a company. And so, um, as you do when you work at a place for a certain amount of time, you get tired and want to go somewhere else. Uh, and I, I had this friend of mine who had been driving me to work for several years, uh, William. Um, he had quit Twitter, and he was like, we're going to start a company. I thought it was crazy. And he's like, no, 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 like, look at what's happening with Docker, right? I, I haven't used Docker. I've been in this Twitter hole for a while. But I knew about Mesos and Aurora, and I knew about, I knew about what would I learn to become microservices. They were called SOA or services, service-oriented architecture at Twitter. Um, but it, it was clear to me that there was an opportunity, and the, the types of tools I was working on at Twitter, I could go work on as my full-time job in open source, which has been a huge part of my life since I've been in college, basically. Uh, and so that's what I, we set out to do. And we basically took Twitter's code, <laughs> Twitter Finagle, and we were like, how do we, this great thing that we know has all this operational value, has all this power, is this, this uniform layer of control and visibility, how do we make that something that people who don't want to write Scala on the JVM can benefit from? Can we make that a component or a product that, that we can drop in there? And so Linkerd1, which we created and started working on in 2015, was released in 2016, uh, was the first version of that. Um, it was super configurable. So coming from that, that framework we had, both in the JVM and Finagle, we had really good abstractions for service discovery. So nothing was Zookeeper specific. We could talk about marrying Zookeeper and Kubernetes and console and etcd and 
building topologies that incorporate all of these things. And most of the places Linkerd one was deployed was to kind of satisfy these complicated multi-scheduler flexibility cases. And of course, we have all of this, like we took all of that routing logic I was just talking about, dropped it into Finagle by, by, into Linkerd by default, and that meant you had to go learn a bunch of complex configuration around service naming and fallbacks, et cetera, to get any of this working. And it was, it's a nice system. There are people out there who really love it, really have done some very sophisticated things that are kind of over my head, honestly. Um, but it's a lot to get started. And if this is gonna be useful, it can't, you, you can't like, require a course on, on service mesh to get started with it. And Linkerd one had this deployment model. Um, again, this is Kubernetes was floating out in the ether, but it was not 1.0 yet. There was Swarm and Nomad and Mesos and Marathon, like just a big messy container orchestration ecosystem. And our model coming from the Mesos world of Twitter was, well, we can have one of these on every host. It'll handle basically connection multiplexing all of the hard thing at a host level. Um, it's the JVM, so we can only really get it down to 150 megs or so if we really squeeze and pray, um, which is, is, you know, 150 megs per host is like, okay, <laughs> if you're not on a micro host or anything really small, uh, but as a pod model, running one of these per pod becomes wild if you have a 10 meg Go application, right? Like, how do you compare the memory footprints of these things? And so, over time, um, Folks put together a really interesting topology to Linkerd, uh, but we kind of realized that the complexity there was not the path forward. So some of the lessons there, again, configuration is the root of all evil. Um, there get, if you, anyone written a DTAB in here? Okay, a few of you. Anyone like writing DTABs? Okay, Alex is in here. I know one person who likes writing DTABs. Uh, but they're, they're a wild dark art. The JVM is also kind of the root of all evil. <laughs> uh, I, I would have been offended by that a couple years ago, but um, it, it's a really nice system for building lots of enterprise applications, especially Twitter, everything is built on the JVM. It, it works, it's great, but when you're at this point in the infrastructure, in the data path, it's just really not suitable um, from a resources point of view. Uh, Linkerd did, we, we knew this microservice thing was happening, but no one was talking about it really quite yet. Uh, Linkerd at first was really positioned of like, oh, it's gonna replace F5 load balancers and all sorts of weird things that you could use it for, but weren't really our intent. Um, and over time, we really saw that everyone who was picking up Linkerd seriously was doing so because they had microservice problems. And the other thing we learned is that Kubernetes is king. Uh, Kubernetes is one, we can all agree, or I can proclaim. Um, it, it was really obvious that the Kubernetes model, the pod model, was so much more usable than what was out there otherwise. Co-scheduling processes, like a proxy with an application, is an obvious fallout of the pod model that, that just works well. Uh, doing that in Mesos and Aurora at the time was quite cumbersome. Uh, and so focusing on that as a security model, being able to have per pod security guarantees or, or privacy or, or isolation, uh, we knew that Kubernetes was gonna be the king. And so sometime in 2016, we started prototyping new proxies. We wrote Linkerd TCP, which was a, uh, our first version of Linkerd 2 in a way. And then I think it was KubeCon 2017 um, in Austin, where we announced something called Conduit. And Conduit was our, our experimental version of what became Linkerd 2. Um, and it's a Kubernetes native service mesh. So we've ditched well, I don't wanna say we've ditched support for everything else, but we've ditched support for everything else. We don't support DTABs anymore. We don't have a flexible, a flexible discovery system. We're betting on Kubernetes primitives through and through. The first thing you have to get here, or the reason to install Linkerd is get out of the box of traffic observability. Kubernetes does a great job of showing you the state, the metrics, various things about the resources as they're running, what pods are running on what nodes, how much memory they're using, how many CPU cycles they're using, et cetera. Those can all be great and healthy and your site can be down. And so we need a way that actually looks at the traffic that's uniform across the system so we can really have the tools to build and operate uh, live applications on top of Kubernetes. We also wanna provide out-of-the-box MTLS identity. 
And that means, uh, we have, before, uh, uh, before we implemented this, we had lots of requests around, I want TLS. And no one really could articulate what TLS was. Some people wanted to do ingress TLS, some people wanted to do egress TLS. And after having a bunch of those conversations, we realized that the pod-to-pod -pod communication is what's squarely within our wheelhouse and what we can do automatically without configuration. Again, I hate configuration. So what we do is, uh, if we, as we discover, uh, as we do discovery, we talk to the Kubernetes API, we know if Linkerd is installed on both sides of the connection. And if it is, we opportunistically add TLS to the thing. It all gets discovered transparently, and we just do it. It's all tied to service accounts. Uh, there's a lot of room for improvement there, but it just works out of the box, and it's awesome. Uh, 2.7, the next release, which as soon as I get back from KubeCon, I'll get back to working on, uh, we're gonna be adding MTLS to all TCP metrics out of the box, or all TCP traffic out of the box. Additionally, uh, it's not just this kind of baseline security and visibility concerns. Uh, there's a whole bunch we can do in the reliability space, and so one of the obvious things that people were picking up Linkerd1 for was surprisingly gRPC load balancing. Uh, that kind of surprised me at the time, but most load balancers, like Kube Proxies load balancer, for instance, is just a connection level load balancer. So uh, you get one connection here, you get one connection there, you get one connection there, and then all the requests in that connection are bound on that. With HTTP load balancing, we can actually look at the request, right? Each request gets, can be dispatched to a different host on that connection. We look at the latency from the response, and that informs our node selection. And so we can really substantially, I have another whole talk on how we can improve success rate just by doing load balancing. Uh, it's a really important tool night, toolkit. Uh, we chose to do uh, not in Scala in the JVM. We made a decision that we wanted to write uh, the control plane in Go because we thought client Go was awesome. Uh, it's, it's awesome, I guess, but it's quite a bit more difficult than we thought. Uh, we had written our own Kubernetes client in Scala, and it was, um, well, Monzo's written some great blog posts about their incidents, let me put it that way. Uh, <laughs> it, the Kubernetes API is, you don't want to write a client for it. It's a really hard thing to get right. You're dealing with a distributed system and converging states. It's just very difficult. So we wanted to leverage something like Client Go that would hopefully solve a lot of those problems for us. Uh, I have some hindsight things in here, but I'll share that for later. Uh, and the other decision is that we wanted a Rust data plane. Um, or we wanted a native fast data plane. I'm gonna get into why Rust and all of that in a bit, but we knew the JVM wasn't gonna work. We knew we needed a native language, and so we went Rust. Oh, and finally, I get to use Prometheus and Grafana's, Grafana. So we bundle a small Prometheus instance with us, uh, with some default Grafana dashboards, so that you just get some basic stats out of the box without having to do extra configuration. You can, of course, configure another Prometheus to scrape all this data. Uh, we're working on making the Prometheus part pluggable so you can just use your own directly and not use ours. There's a bunch of work there. But our goal, like, we don't want to build that. We just want to use tools that are good there. And it all kind of hangs together like this. Um, this is uh, slightly inaccurate because our, our topology is always changing. But the main idea here is that we have Basically, a, a microservice in the control plane. It's a bunch of Go controllers, operators, mission controllers, et cetera. Um, GRPC services to the proxy. Uh, and those all run in a dedicated namespace. They can be replicated um, besides Prometheus. And then we have proxies that get added to every pod or every pod that you enable it to. So there's a, a mutating webhook uh, called the proxy injector up in the top there. Every time a pod gets created in your system, Kubernetes says, hey, Linkerd, what should I do to this pod manifest? And if it looks right, we add the proxy to it. If it looks very wrong, we'll reject it. Otherwise, we'll probably let it through. And then we add a proxy. IP table stuff gets set up there. This is the whole service mesh config dance that I don't want to go into right now. And so um, I don't have a lot of lessons around Linkerd2 because we're still right in the middle of it. And so I, I think anything I have to say won't be that insightful. But I have a few things I want to harp on. Kubernetes is the database. Um, this is something Thomas, uh, Thomas Rampenberg on our team said to me uh, earlier this year, and it, it's something I've been chewing on since. Kubernetes is a totally open database. So you can think of it like etcd, but you have schemas and CRDs, and we have this data model. We have pods and service accounts and labels. We have that taxonomy to some degree that we're missing in other systems, right? Ha having to describe what workload coordinates are we get for free out of Kubernetes, and we have a label system that we can use to do selections. 
And so I, I think that's still a little too open-ended for a production system. You want to have some constraints and say every pod must have these labels, et cetera. But this is a great building block. And on top of that, now we have things like API extensions. I can go add new endpoints into the Kubernetes API. I can add custom resource definitions that have schemas that are validated before they go in. We have built an operational database that happens to have these controllers running on them that just persists the state of the running system. It's awesome. Like, if I had this when, if we had thought about Aurora and Mesos and Zookeeper in terms of this with that nice API, uh, I think that project would have been much more successful. Having to go figure out how to use Zookeeper from first principles and having a validation, et cetera, um, was not really workable. I would not have said this last year, but I have come to the conclusion that the world needs more reference architectures. Uh, it's weird, but we get folks all the time who say, I really want to do multi-region, or I really want to do tracing, even. And we get into that, and there's actually very little in terms of Linkerd features that can or should be done there. Uh, really what folks are looking for is I need a pattern that shows how do I do instrument tracing from an ingress through my application and benefit the mesh in that. That all together is a useful thing. Any one slice of that is not actually gonna get anyone into prod. And so similarly, things like multi-cluster and multi-region, we really have to think about global scale load balancing and what does failover mean? There's some big concerns here that probably don't, I hope don't belong in Linkerd, but uh, we'll solve them if we have to. And the other uh, slow, lesson I've been learning slowly is that uh, infrastructure projects like those in the CNCF uh, only succeed by building trust slowly over time. And there is no one talk I will give to you that will convince you that Linkerd is production ready or really convince you to use it even. Um, but what we have to do as project maintainers and, and community is just keep showing up, being really open and clear in our communication. Uh, and so certainly in 2020, we're gonna be focusing um, heavily on that side of things. Okay, I'll take a little sip of water. Um, so why another proxy? Uh, and I know I'm probably running out of time. Uh, proxy goals, one, small in terms of memory. Uh, if this is a sidecar that's in every pod, uh, it can't be, it can't even be 10 megs. I think right now we're at like two to six by default uh, with a couple hundred RPS. Um, it needs to be fast in terms of low latency. We can't have garbage collection pauses, adding lots of latency, unpredictability into the system. And so the, uh, we also need it to be pretty cheap. If we're consuming your CPU quota, you're not gonna have a good CPU, like you're not gonna have a good time in your cluster, so we need to make sure that's low overhead. This probably should've been first, but it needs to be safe. I'm not putting heart bleed on every node in your cluster. Like, that is not an incident I wanna deal with. And finally, it has to be malleable. Like, I have to be able to work in this thing and modify it every day. I can't use some general thing that's kind of off the shelf and configurable. Um, we wanna go build features that touch the data plane, and to do that, this has to be something that I actually wanna work on every day. So that leads us to one, no garbage collection, no, no G, JVM, no Go. Uh, a native language to get that memory footprint down to get that CPU usage proper. And this one might be a little more surprising, I need a strong type system in my life. Um, <laughs> I am not smart enough to write good or at least workable software without a type system and a compiler that's gonna help me. And so I, this was something we learned from Scala and, and really um, ported forward with us and not going away anytime soon. And so we also wanna be able to specialize and that's in terms of one, it's not a configurable thing. If any, there might be a proxy config, but I'll never say. Uh, this is something that is opaque in its implementation detail and we wanna keep that really, um, keep it that way. Part of that is we do transparent protocol detection. You never have to tell us what protocol a given port's talking. Well, you might in the future for very weird reasons, but everything should just work out of the box and we, we wanna customize to that. We wanna do automatic transparent TL MTLS within the mesh, and so we have some customized logic there that's specific to Linkerd on how that gets initiated and terminated. Uh, something most folks don't know is that we do automatic HTTP2 multiplexing between every proxy. So if a proxy's talking to another proxy, it will it should never have more than one connection per pair. Um, and so if you have HTTP one service in, between, in your app, we will take that, we'll shove that all through an HTTP channel to the other Linkerd, 
And then we return it back into HTTP1 on the other side, and so it actually really saves on cross data center connection initialization costs and MTLS costs, et cetera. Finally, we're, uh, not finally, but we, um, we want to have really, really, really good Prometheus integration. When we started, we met with Frederick from the Prometheus pro project, and he was like, the community is not getting this. We need really good Prometheus support in a, in a proxy like this. So he helped us work on that. Um, we have lots of, we basically take all the Kubernetes meta, metadata and just shove that into the labels for the traffic. So we have really hydrated stats that can do things like dependencies, et cetera. We have something called LinkedIn tap, which I don't know of in any other system, but is a way for us to basically push in queries into a live running proxy. So rather than say, I'm gonna log everything to Splunk or whatever and query it afterwards, we can actually connect to proxies at runtime and say, show me requests that look like these. I wanna dig in and see live requests that look at these things. So if you go to Linkerd dashboard, you'll see lots of live requests that's all powered by Linkerd tap. And there's a whole bunch more we're gonna do there. Um, I don't know what in what order, um, my focus right now is very much on the security roadmap, but there will be lots more things that we want to do in the data plane as the project goes on. All right, I'm gonna whip through the Rust Evangelism strike force. Um, here's what some proxy code looks like after about two years of fighting it. Uh, we actually have really nice composable layers here. This is the outbound endpoint stack. So per, for every endpoint, we create a service that has all of these layers. At the outer side, we have a, the bottom there, we have a tracing layer which gives us some extra context for log messages and errors. We instrument with metrics, with tap. We do protocol upgrading, we strip headers. And what the point is here, we can write lots of orthogonal separated bits of logic that are testable independently that we can compose together to build the proxy logic. Uh, that's something we learned again from taking from Finagle and Twitter and porting forward into Rust and the Tower ecosystem. Okay, this quote is the nicest thing anyone has ever said about my work, so I just have to put it up on a slide once at least. Uh, we had a security audit done with CNCF in July. We worked with this group, Cure53, in Berlin. Uh, they found two minor bugs in our, our web dashboard. Um, as of Edge two weeks ago, we fixed them. They'll both be fixed in the next stable release. Uh, but they gave us really glowing reviews about the project and um, the way we work on it. So don't take my word for it, take theirs. Okay. Wrapping up. Big bets for 2020. Mandatory TLS by default, something we're gonna do. This has to be iMessage. There can't be a, I'm gonna just enable TLS opportunistically and maybe it's not there and I have all these auditing tools. We need to get to a place where this is just mandatory if it's not TLS or a health check or a readiness probe, then we will fail the request and that has to be how it works. We need to get to, after we get there, we can start to talk about intercluster identity and policy. This is a big request. This is not something we're gonna do, though, until we've nailed the identity model. And so we need to get to cross-cluster identity, but uh, that's after we get identity nailed. And this is the craziest bet, I think, on the slide, is that I wanna reduce Linkerd's line to code by at least 10%. I think there's, uh, I wanna maintain less code, I wanna have uh, a better ecosystem of libraries, et cetera, and so we're gonna definitely push on that. And part of that, part of all three of those things is the service mesh interface. This is a partnership we're doing with Microsoft and HashiCorp and some other folks uh, around standard, standardizing certain CRDs, certain API extensions, so that integrators who wanna do things like, like Flagger does traffic splitting and traffic shifting, they don't have to implement that to any one service mesh, they can just use the interface. And if they wanna read metrics about those services, they can just use a standard interface and not write to any one service mesh. Uh, furthermore, I, think, I hope that we'll be donating or, or finding common implementations of many core components that Linkerd shouldn't be maintaining. Things like the CNI, the proxy init container which configures IP tables, and some of the multi-cluster uh, syncing things we'll have to do, I think all belong in SMI, and we're gonna have to work with that community to do that. Okay, the big flashy slide that I'm required to have here is that we've been in production for a long time, we're doing awesome, um, <laughs> and uh, we, we had the security audit done, we've added distributed tracing recently, and 2020 stuff is really, again, getting the security mode up advanced and making that extend across clusters. I'll let you take a picture and then I'm gonna change slides. Thank you very much. Please come get involved, uh, the more the merrier. And if you have questions, I'll try to field them here or we have a booth somewhere and find me there. Thanks. Thanks.